CDC Director of eLearning, and I'm delighted that you're able to join us today for our webinar, which is entitled Mobile eVisits in the Medical Home, Implications of a New Delivery Model. This is being sponsored by the PCPCC Care Delivery and Integration Stakeholder Center. We have a really, truly great program lined up for you, and I'd like to start out first with a couple of brief announcements. Uh, first off, our PCPCC website, pcpcc.net, has just been relaunched, and it has a wonderful new look and feel. <coughs> I'm sure many of you may probably already be quite familiar with it, but I invite all of you to give it another look and a test drive, especially if you haven't yet browsed through this very easy-to-navigate new model. Secondly, just want to make a quick shout out about the fall PCPCC Summit, which was being held October 13th to 15th in Bethesda, Maryland. It's another new venue for us, and it's, a, it's an extended conference duration. And I think it's a great opportunity to learn and network with your other colleagues in the patient Center medical home arena. The registration for the event is now open, of course, on PCPCC.net. And uh, last but not least, the PCPCC is launching a new special interest group for eHealth information technology next month. The launch is going to include a webinar and a monthly briefing and a newsletter focus on the topic. If you're interested in participating in the, in the new eHealth uh, IT special interest group, you can contact Tara Hacker on the PCPCC staff. Uh, Tara's email, if you're interested, is thacker. That's T-H-A-C-K-E-R at pcpcc.net. So on to our webinar. Um, we're very pleased to have with us today Dr. William C. Thornberry, who's a family physician from South Central Kentucky, and he's the founder of MeVisit, a technology company that's pledged to help pioneer solutions to improve healthcare delivery and to help end medical homelessness. Dr. Thornberry began his medical training at the University of Kentucky, graduating from the College of Pharmacy, and he studied medicine at the University of Louisville with training in both general surgery and family medicine. He's trained under the direct supervision of Toyota and Lean Systems, and this is directly related to his work in engineering the mobile e-visit model of medical delivery. Dr. Thornberry has practiced medicine for 15 years, and he has special expertise in family and internal medicine. Dr. Thornberry will be joined today by these special guests. We have Lindu Fouché, the Human Resources Coordinator at Farmers Electric, Farmers Rural Electric. Farmers Rural Electric is located in South Central Kentucky, and it's a member-owned rural electric distribution electric cooperative, which employs 65 people of various educational and socioeconomic backgrounds. Their employees are self-insured with North America Administrators of Nashville, Tennessee, and for the fourth year in a row, their company has, has seen success in significantly controlling its medical costs. They've improved communications, created engagement, and utilized a voluntary wellness program, a safety program, and have also provided educational components to their employees. A substantial and major part of their educational component has been to offer and implement the first generation telemedicine me visit initiatives to its employees. Linda is going to be offering us insight into an industry partner's perspective of mobile e-visit technology within the workforce and its success in controlling the cost of insured risk. Also joining us today is John Rogers, attorney and senior partner of Rogers Law Office in Glasgow, Kentucky. John served as an assistant Commonwealth attorney for the 43rd Judicial District. He's been president or is president of the Barn County Bar Association and he served as legal counsel for the local chapter of Habitat for Humanity. He's admitted to practice before the U.S. Bankruptcy Court and the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Kentucky, as well as the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Kentucky and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth District. He is also admitted to practice in the state court in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Additionally, John has served as the chair of the Kentucky Registry of Elect Election Finance. John's going to be offering us insight into how mobile e-visit technology affects patients. And thirdly, Ana Maria Lorenzo, who is a clinic administrator at Medical Associates Clinic in Barron County, Kentucky. Ana Maria brings 15 years of clinical experience to support the Medical Associates Clinic administrator and, the, and nursing staff. She's had experience in every area of physician management, as well as having served as a registered medical assistant in California. 
Anna Maria will offer insight into how mobile e-visit technology integrates into clinical workflow and how providers view the technology. A note about questions, you can submit these at any time during the presentations with a drop-down box over on the right of your webinar screen. We're going to try to get to as many of the questions as we can at the conclusion of the presentations, but I'm sure that our presenters will be delighted to handle the ones we don't get to offline, and we'll get the questions and answers posted up on the PCC website as soon as possible. You'll also be able to get copies of today's slides and a recording of today's broadcast within 24 to 48 hours on pcpcc.net slash media. So be before turning the mic over to Dr. Thornberry, I need to make one final disclaimer. The PCPCC does not endorse products or solutions, and we're not endorsing the, PC the Me Visit product. But we are bringing you today the compelling story of how mobile e-visit technology can enhance and transform access and communication in the medical home. I hope you'll enjoy Dr. Thornberry's skill in delivering this message without bias or commercials. So take it away, Dr. Thornberry. Well, Chris, uh, thank you very much. And uh, to our guest that's joined, up this after joined us this afternoon, thank you for making time in your uh, very busy schedule to do so. Uh, we'd like to thank. Uh, uh, both our moderator, Christopher Nordren, uh, Lauren Vandergraft, and in particular, Andy Gibson from the PCPCC for allowing us to make the, the opportunity <clears throat> to demonstrate some of the technology we've been working on. I'm going to recant a, uh, a uh, presentation I gave exactly one month ago today at HIMSS in New Orleans. This is the first time that we've made our technology public. Uh, this is a mobile e-visit technology we've been working on in development uh, through Lean Health Systems, uh, one of the uh, true uh, intellectual technologies uh, that is dear to my heart. <clears throat> my disclosure is that uh, I have uh, ownership interest in Joe Bathco Enterprises. It expends for medical technology, and that's just a roundabout way of saying that in order to develop the technology to share with all patients and all physicians that want it, we had to form a company to, to keep the accountants happy. Our learning objectives today are I'd like to recognize the cultural pressures driving e-technology in healthcare. We're going to review a two-year study of the technology in our practice with our academic partner, the University of Kentucky. I'd like to summarize the goal benefits of mobile e-visit technology. And lastly, I'd like to define the implications for each part of the health system of making the medical home virtual. About a year and a half ago, I was in uh, Las, Las Vegas uh, for uh, HIMSS. And I was listening to one of our country's uh, senior telecom executives, and the first thing he said was, he said, you know, if we can just reduce our health care cost 1%, it would be tens of millions of dollars for our company. And he goes, we do this every single day. Every single day we come to work, we look at this. And it occurred to me at that time that we were working on a technology that I thought might just apply to them. But in an answer, most people look for a single solution, and, and I would uh, give the analogy, the middle analogy of, say, the Titanic. If you have the Titanic moored to a, a, a dock, it's not just one line that keeps it moored, it's several lines. And that's what I think that we have in, in using technology that we begin to develop. It's, it's several moorings to a large problem like healthcare delivery in the United States. Today, when we finish, I want to demonstrate that mobile e-visits are normally possible, but they're safe, they're effective, and patients love them. We're going to demonstrate that they enhance the triple aim. And for some of our guests that aren't familiar with that, that is to improve the patient experience, to lower the cost of care, and to advance the population health of our country. We're going to show that, the, that mobile e-visits have an opportunity for a positive disruption in our health delivery system. And lastly, I'd like to get, have you kind of keep in the back of your mind that distance may not diminish care. I put this very busy slide up just for a second. It's not to be intended to be read, but this was actually came across the newswire one week ago today. And this is a study in the United Kingdom that talks about first generation telehealth, and they're they're questioning whether it's a it's 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 just viable from an economic point of view and a social point of view. And I'll get into that a little bit later, but I did want to let you understand that this is very, very timely in our health system. Trust. You know, it's all about trust. 
We bank with people that we trust online. We shop with vendors and merchants that we trust online. And we're going to seek health care from physicians and health systems that we trust. Probably over the course of this talk, a lot of you will be looking at emails, exchanging texts with people thousands of miles away. And I believe that mHealth offers answers that we should consider. The culture that shops online, that banks online, that buys books, movies, and music online is going to conduct a portion of their health care online. My question is, with whom are they going to conduct it? I don't know if very many of you have heard these words, but every day in my clinic we used to have to tell people that we could not see them. And there are millions of people in our country that every day hear these words. It got to the position three or four years ago where we were having three or four patients every day, even working 12 hours a day, that we could not see. We would never be able to take a new patient. Unless somebody moved away or passed away, we could not do that. It just wasn't possible. I work in a rural multi-specialty clinic in South Central Kentucky, and we were just simply full. And I'm going to remind you what everybody knows here, but this is the health system that I work in. We have people that retire at 10,000 a day right now. We have almost 100,000 physicians by 2020. The AMA tells us that we're going to be short. And you may not have caught this, but in January, when the ACA became quite evident that we're moving in this direction permanently, that almost 50,000 equivalent work physicians are going to cut back. That's to say they're going to work just enough to make retirement, maybe one or two days a week. In 2005, the NIH, through a joint committee of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering, sent out a statement. They said that our health system, both the way it's organized and the way that we deliver it, is simply not sustainable. And if you didn't get the memo, seven years later, just like a cicadia, the IOM came back and said, looking at the same data, our health system is simply too cost-effective and complex to continue. This was last September. Our standard of medical care has been the physician in the room with the patient. And yet, our health system, though we want to advance, struggles. Technology is progressing exponentially. I mean, we live in an era where information moves in nanoseconds. Yet, people come to the physician just the same way our grandparents came to the physician. They sit in a chronically congested medical office for hours to receive care. We've just fallen victim to inertia. I think the biggest indictment that I have is that we can't get the benefit of our knowledge in probably the most technologically advanced area in, in the world to the people that need it the most. But innovation lives where challenges exist. But Mr. Fuller said, and I'll read this for the people that may have visual impairment that are our guests, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I guess I would say to our guests, our, 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 our listeners today, what does rebarb have to do with health care? Well, a lot of people that are listening to me have read Dr. Clayton Christensen's work from Harvard. We talked about innovative disruption. And rebarb is probably the lowest form of steel. It's just junk steel. They use it in industry, and it's the least profitable. And most people, particularly the larger players in the steel industry, he told us, didn't want anything to do with it. They couldn't make any money. But somewhere along the way, somebody came across and said, you know, we have a new way to, to develop this product. We can actually make a profit at making this. And once that happens in the lowest profit, worst type of, mar of, 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 of portion of an industry, then it begins to, to, to develop through the whole industry. And I would submit that the work that we're doing here is very similar to that. I want to show you how we can now make a profit on Medicaid and Medicare. Do you know who this is? Do you recognize her? Well, this is my employer. And I want to tell you a little bit about my employer. 25% of the time in our country, people use a symptom checker just as much as going to the, to the physician. A little more than that, they actually use a symptom checker instead of going to the doctor. That's how good our system is. And 10% of the people fully believe that something they've read online has saved their life. 70 million people in our country already have online access to their doctor. Worldwide, there are 6 billion cell phones. And the cell phones of the day are the smartphones of tomorrow. Of the 6 billion, a billion of them are smartphones, and that's going to double by 2015. By 2015 also, five, a half a billion of these smartphones will have medical apps, if not more.
Do you know who really makes the health decisions in our country? Well, this is a little bit busy of a busy slide, but I want to just walk you through it for a second. On the upper left-hand corner where it says person and family, that's talking about you and I. In the overwhelming majority of our lives, we make the health care decisions for ourselves. I mean, sometimes we call the physician, sometimes we go to the hospital, but most of the time we don't. And in our health system, until the very end of your life, as the curve begins to diminish at the end, we make decisions. So at the very end of our life, when we're mentally or physically or emotionally incapacitated, somebody else makes decisions. Say you might be in an intensive care unit where the health care system is making decisions on your behalf. But overwhelmingly, you make decisions on your, on your behalf. And in the health system, we sometimes become, well, we just get kind of numb to it. What happens is, is we, we think that because people come to us every day, all day long, well, we have all the answers. But most people don't come to us every day, all day long. This is a statement a few years ago. This was three years ago almost, two and a half. And what this says is where almost 90% of the people want the convenience of using online technology with their doctors. This is, these are patients asking themselves what they want. This was, not a, this was not a study by a medical group. And I guess I, I, I would say that to me this is the golden rule. The people with the gold in healthcare are going to make the rules. And that would be the public. They get to decide what they want. And I would submit that in our culture, they've already decided that they're going to use e-commerce. People already have cell phones and smartphones. They already buy things online. They use health care online. They use email. But just because patients want something doesn't mean it's the best thing for them. About 10 or 15 years ago, many of us with a little bit more maturity have a, have a recollection that that's when Viagra came out. And it was, it was available online and on the radio. And in my field, people just said, well, those charlatan, doctor, those charlatan doctors are just going to kill somebody. They've lost their minds. And a gentleman, a farm D named Mark Munger at the University of Utah and his group said, well, we're going to measure this. And they did a five-year study. And at the, end five, at the end of five years, do you know what it said? Well, here's the business end of what they had to find. On the left is traditional medicine being safer. But on the right is online care being safer. And it wasn't even close. And although it's counterintuitive, actually for minor health problems, it was actually found to be safer to conduct care online. And the reason for that is, is because when you program a computer to do what it does best, that is ask questions or deliver information, well, it's going to do it every single time the same way until you change it. So it's going to ask every single question that you want to ask a patient. It's going to deliver all the information exactly the way you have it until the science changes or you change the information you want to give the patient. And for us in medicine, that may be one of the answers of how we can move forward and use computers to work with us instead of against us. Well, one of my mentors, Dr. John Bachman at the University, I mean at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and his colleague Dr. Adamson conducted the, the definitive care of online, the definitive study of online care in the medical home. So he took Dr. Munger's work and said, well, if online care appears to be safe, what is it like conducting this inside the medical home? And what they found over a couple years was 2,500 cases, no adverse outcomes that they reported. They didn't report any quality problems. And yet they said for all, almost 300 diagnoses, that, that about 40% of the time they could prevent a patient from needing to come to the office. And I happened to be in Boston when Dr. Bachman presented this, and I talked to him for a little while afterwards, and I remembered, it said, it, it just to me, I said, this is part of our solution. I don't know where it's going to fit in, but, but somewhere going forward, we're going to begin to need to do work online with patients. So I kind of filed it away, which kind of brings me back to my full clinic. It occurred to me that looking at my clinic every day where I had to turn patients down, well, we could not take any new patients. That, you know, I'm not just some Kentucky doctor, that I'm really every physician in our medical system. I mean, heck, I, I'm, the, I'm the health system itself. We had to find a way to somehow bring patients to us that we couldn't, that we couldn't reach. So what, I, what occurred to me, I had an opportunity to train, train with Toyota, and we trained and learned and trying to understand how we could apply lean systems to our healthcare model. We looked at our clinic and said, well, you know, how can we make things better? And the problem wasn't that the doctor's not seeing enough patients or they're too slow. And the problem wasn't 
the checkout system has too many steps. The problem, the root cause that we came up with was there are 30, 40 percent of the people that just do not need to be in our clinic. I mean, we ask them to come back and, and we're in a fee-for-service model and that's how we get paid. And then, I mean, maybe you could be altruistic and say, well, you know, that's how we're trained. We're trained to bring people back at a certain, a certain interval. But you know, from my point of view, it didn't make it the right thing to do. So we said, you know what, I'm not going to kick the can down the road anymore. I'm going to do something for my part of the health system in rural Kentucky, and, 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 and I'm going to try to effect a change. And I remember Dr. Bachman's work. And I said, you know, listen, I'll, I'll, make it, I'll, I'll do online care. That'll work for me. So what we did was we started online care, and I'll tell you, that worked for about a week. And then all of a sudden, somebody wanted to do an e-visit after hours. Well, the problem with that for me was I had to go, first of all, I had to be near a computer. So if they did a visit, I had to be wherever I was at, I had to find a computer, go online, open up a program, go into another computer, open up another program, and into a file. And all this time I'm trying to conduct a visit, and it took, just to conduct the whole visit was 10 or 15 minutes. And for me, it just wasn't an elegant way to do it. So I said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make it mobile. I'll, you know, I'll send the e-visit through my cell phone, or my, my, my smartphone, and that way no matter where I'm at, I can conduct the visit. And that worked for about three or four days. And what happens is, is you get the visit and you say, well, okay, I've got, this is what's wrong with you. Maybe you have poison ivy and, and, and I, this is what I'm going to do for you and this is what you, you should expect. And then it kind of occurred to me that, you know, maybe I could be litigated for something like this if it didn't go the right way. And that kind of gave me another thought. I said, well, unless these visits are safe, unless they're efficient for the physician, they're really worthless. They might work great for the patient, but until we can get the physicians in, engaged, there's just, we, we need to come up, come, up with, come up with another way. So we began to work on that. And what we did was we developed a technology uh, kind of in, 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 our, in, in the back room and said, how are we going to make these visits two or three or four minutes? That's about all the time I'm going to get from a physician. We got them down to an average time of about three minutes. And when they became efficient, then it really hit me. All of a sudden, we basically have a house call through the smartphone. And one of my colleagues very quickly told me, he said, you know what, I've been working in mobile health for like a decade. And he says, this is, as far as I'm concerned, the holy grail of mobile health. It's your doctor in your pocket on a cell phone. And I don't know about that, but I do know this. It's, if you think about it for a little while, it's certainly a next generation or new generation of telemedicine. I mean, if we can get e-visits through the smartphone to your own physician, not some nurse practitioner two states away that doesn't know you, but, but your own doctor. And you know what? If we make them efficient and make them quick, the doctors, their physicians can remain engaged with their patient. If we do that, then what we get for free is we get free mobile. I can call the patient if I need to. We get free video. I can do a video call if I need to. So I kind of get the telemedicine, the, the telemedicine part really for free. Well, in our country, 85% of the people already have mobile phones. And 80% of the adults use the Internet. And I'll tell you what, the people that aren't doing it are dying off every day. Most of the time, what we found in the last couple of years is that people that don't conduct this have friends or family that actually begin to help them to conduct it. And I'll show you a slide here that might be reminiscent to you. If you look at the very right-hand lower corner in real tiny print, it says PCPCC. And I've taken this directly off of our website here at the PCPCC. These are the evidence of what it's like to put health care in the medical home. You see, when you make online care mobile in the medical home, well, then you make the medical home virtual. And that, in my opinion, is, is the real hidden savings of our health system. It follows the principle of, 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 of lean where patients can get online care when they need it. So that would be care with their doctor wherever and whenever they are. And every model that we've ever studied from, from academic uh, Dr. Starfield at Johns Hopkins to, uh, to, to countries such as Denmark, and heck, even in January, the Commonwealth Fund came out with another study that demonstrated where people were saving enormous amounts of money using the medical home model. Well, this now allows us to apply telehealth and telemedicine to our medical home model. I'd like to just kind of give you a visual image of what we're working on here. We allow people to 
log into a secure site on, uh, that we developed uh, in our practice. They could either do it through a cell phone, or, and most people actually elected to use a home or work computer. And they would be asked uh, either uh, to pick from a small list of 10 or 15 quick things, cough, cold, UTI, or they could just put a symptom, cough, cold. They could write, in this case, poison ivy. They could attach up to five photographs if they wish to. And then from the, from the physician's point of view, what the physician saw was the, the interrogation engine that was used, which took five or ten minutes to ask the patients fourth or fifth grade questions, delivered us a full HPI. And in the HPI traditional format for the physician to make it very intellectually easy to understand, the abnormals are bolded, the normals are minimized to uh, diminish the intellectual noise. At the end of the questions, we allow the patients the opportunity to write anything that they want to write. And my my all-time favorite actually is, uh, I had a lady write, uh, Dr. Thornberry, I want to remind you that I've had bariatric surgery and I can't swallow pills. Can you give me liquid? And these are just things that the computer is simply never going to pick up. When patients first join the service that we, we ask, them, ask them to sign up. We have kind of a point and click, uh, what's wrong with you? And we, we try to acquire just basic information. And what we want for the clinician is the very, the most basic information regarding their past history. I, I don't want the, super, the, the, uh, the, the distracting elements. We want only what's going to make a difference for this decision. Again, we're looking at minor problems here. So I want to know what their allergies are, what their medicines are, what their medical problems are generally are. I want from this screen, if I need to, and I have a history, a past history, and a history of the problem, I want to, I want to call those patients. And we know about 30% of the time we actually did call them from here. If on the rare occasion I need to call their pharmacy, I want to be able to telephone them from here. And then lastly, we developed a system where we had the information cataloged so that we could, we could adapt it on the fly, but the majority of the information we could present to the patient very efficiently. And it said, for example, the uh, poison plant dermatitis, well, this is what we think is going on with you. This is uh, what we're going to do. This is what you should expect. If things don't go well, this is, uh, this is how to contact us, and this is what we want you to look for. So that's kind of what, uh, very, very quickly in your mind, what, what we were trying to go back and forth between patients and providers. Well, we took this and did, we, when I first started working with this, I would digress and say that the first thing I did was I had to be confessed, confessed to you and said I called Apple. And I asked Apple, I said, well, where's your app for this? And they go, we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and my heart kind of sank a little bit. So I had, a, I had, a, I had one of my sisters uh, is in, uh, is in uh, Penn State. And she works at the, at the uh, medical school. And I asked uh, my sister, I said, well, would you please do a, a, a literature search on who's conducting mobile care, uh, mobile online care in, uh, in the health system? She says, well, we don't see anything in the literature. So I went to my colleagues at one of our regional universities, University of Kentucky, and we asked them to help us with the pilot study to just look at what we were conducting over the last couple of years. At the end of the first year, what we found was that we did a handful of studies, maybe just under 200, 188. Hello? And of the 188 studies, which didn't seem like a lot, my heart kind of sank at the end of the year because I felt like we'd really started making progress. But it occurred to me that, you know, in rural Kentucky, people generally had never heard of an e-visit, much less an online e-visit. We spent about the first six months just kind of educating people. And we didn't advertise. I wanted to treat this just like people would treat this in a, in a regular practice in anywhere USA. So we didn't put a billboard up. All we did was as patients came in, we put a little handbill tell them, telling them about it if we thought it was appropriate for them. Our nurses might spend a minute uh, talking about it with them. I would talk about it maybe in the room for just a second. If people came, called in for a minor problem, we gave them the opportunity to do this. So we, we really weren't doing really much of a sales job. We kind of let it kind of, uh, for, we let it kind of grow uh, and mature on its own. But at the end of the year, after a couple hundred visits, what we found was that almost 80% of them were after hours. That means that when I wasn't near my patients, they were looking for care for somewhere else. You know, once or twice they might do that, but eventually if you can't care for your patients, they're going to go somewhere else. I don't know if that's going to be another health system, if it's going to be uh, an urgent clinic or an ER, but they're going to get care somewhere. We also found that we served nine counties in Kentucky. Now, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, there are just around 100 counties. So just even in the first year, I took care of almost, just one tiny doctor took care of almost 10% of the land area in rural Kentucky. And in rural Kentucky, if they can do it there, it taught me that we can do it anywhere in the country. You know, five of these counties were ARC-designated federally Appalachian counties, so they're federally underserved. Our age... Average, our mean age was about 42 and a half. That means that we had an awful lot of 20 and 30-year-olds that did it. But you know what? 
we had just as many 50 and 60 year olds that did this. 5% of the time, we, we, we felt that the cases were inappropriate. Now, to give you some type of, 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 uh, of, 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 of bearing, Dr. Bachman, in his study of the online care in the medical home, which is traditional online care, was about 11 to 13 percent. So one out of 20 times, people that had never heard of an e-visit were already conducting the care properly. And we gave them just a couple of rules. We said, number one, could your problem wait a day if it had to wait a day? If it had to wait a day, could it? Number two, do you feel like as a patient that this is something that we could take care of on the phone, something minor? And then three, could you give us maybe four hours during the week to conduct the visit and six hours on the weekend? Okay, what was that pen? I mean, it just went totally that is, blank. That is to say that, is to say that, that for patients, well, does it make sense to do this online? And do you want to do it with your doctor? Well, what we found was people, you know, only go to the doctor three or four times a year as a general rule. And even when people, once they conducted the visit, within a few months afterwards, they had actually conducted, a quarter of them had conducted the visit again. And that told me that most of the people liked it. And we were beginning to hear feedback toward the end of the year that people really liked it. Most of the cases were before 9 o'clock at night. And if you think about it for a second, that actually makes sense. Because really, these are for minor problems. What people really want to do is they want to take care of this during the day, and then at lunch or on the way home from work, they want to pick up their, their prescriptions. So what I didn't get very often was maybe at 12 or 1 o'clock at night, I didn't get some type of a, of a virtual visit. I found that when they did it inside the medical home that they were extremely uh, thoughtful with regard to my care. Again, I guess they said, well, you know, I don't need to do this at midnight. I'll just take care of it first thing in the morning. And again, most of our visits were by women and most were in the morning, just like Dr. Bachman found in his work. When our academic partner, the Kentucky UK, interviewed the patients uh, behind our back, what they told us was, that 97 of the patients preferred it. Now I want to clarify this for you so you can fully understand what this means. All the patients told them that they would use it again. They would tell their friends and family about it. But 97% of them actually preferred using this to come to the physician's office. And to be candid with you, I didn't quite know how to take that. But I take it as a compliment. And, and I guess the way I look at it is it's, uh, it's like traveling. And when I travel, I call my wife before I go to sleep and I tell her that I love her. And because I do, it doesn't mean I love her any less. It actually, I hope, demonstrates to her that I love her more. And I think it's like this with health care. A lot of times we, try not, we just don't take into consideration a person or a family's time, their commitment, the cost and, and, and expense it takes to come to the clinic to do basically wait. Well, when you show deference to that, we found that our patients, it actually brought us closer together. It actually engaged the patients. And again, our average turnaround time at the end of the first year was about three minutes. Well, I guess kind of like the late Stephen Jobs, I would just say we've got one more thing here for you. And it's not that we've been conducting these visits for one year. We've been conducting them for two years now, almost two and a half years. So again, we've, we've embargoed the information until, until, until March, but we've been doing this for two and a half years in this part of Kentucky. The second year, we've increased the, the visits now 50%. So we're up to a total of about 500 visits. And again, we're staying right about 80% after hours. We're up to 10 counties served now, again, in a very, very rural state. When you look at it globally, <clears throat> the second year, we didn't just conduct acute problems, which is what the literature supported. We said, well, listen, we're your medical home. We're your family physician. How about we conduct things like minor hypothyroidism, maybe changes in blood pressure when it was appropriate, changes in, mild changes in diabetes, maybe minor depression. You, know, you kind of begin to see that we're, you know, 75 or 70 percent of the health dollar is, can we get these people that, that I feel like may not need to be in our clinic out of the clinic when it's appropriate? Well, we allow 20 percent of the visits to be conducted chronically. And by this time, we had moved the opt-out rate down to 2 percent. And that may be because I'm a conservative physician, but I know this. There's certainly safety in this. And we didn't get a lot of people conducting things that, that were inappropriate. I'd also tell you just from an anecdotal point of view in my private practice that now I can begin to go from just the mild and the mild acute, say, UTI or cough and cold, that I can move things to the moderate level. And for myself, I, the rule of thumb I gave myself was what do I conduct on the phone? When nobody's looking, what, kind of, what do I do by telephone every single day all the time? Well, that, well if I would do that, I would, I would be, allow myself to conduct care through, online, through an online manner. And for me, that was things like, well, some people, kidney stones are completely appropriate. I've had people with 70 or 80 kidney stones. They know the rules about kidney stones more than I know the rules about kidney stones. 
I have people with some diverticulitis. I had a gentleman who was, who was down in Naples with an executive, and he, he did an online visit. The first thing it said was abdominal pain. My heart just sank. And I called him. I said, listen, you cannot do abdominal pain on an e-visit. He goes, now, Doc, listen. I had this six months ago. It's the same thing. I'm down here eating things I shouldn't eat. I'm staying up late with my wife, going to a place I shouldn't go. And I'm telling you, it's my diverticulitis. And, you know, I listened to him for a little while, and I said, okay, I'll bite on that. I'll give you your Cipro and Flagyl. But here's what you have to do for me. You have to call me the next three days in a row to make sure that you're actually getting better. And when I hang up the phone, you're going to look at the closest emergency room, and you're going to find it in the phone number and find out how to get there just in case you're wrong. And for this guy, it worked out. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out, but those are the things that we actually do online. And remember, I told you that not every case comes to us as doctors. Many times people with chest pain or abdominal pain, well, they try to handle the pain. They try to conduct that themselves, but at least now they're involving me. And again, I would point out to the, to the listener that not only are we taking care of now minor problems, but now we're to the moderate problems because we're inside the medical home. And from there, it just, it's, just, it's just a step to chronic stable disease. I told you that we had a 1.7 to 1 female to male ratio, and now, again, our average age is about 40 years old. When you combine the two years of work, which you're doing now before we submit it to publication, we have just a handful under 500 e-visits. Our opt-out rate was about 3%, and again, 80% of these are after hours. That means 80% of the time, I'm not in my clinic. My clinic isn't open 24 hours a day. The distribution rate was 16 to 89, and I want to stop on that for just a moment. I want to talk about that 89-year-old. Who do you think did that visit? Because I'll tell you, it wasn't the 89-year-old that did the visit. Well, it was their daughter. And the implication there is their daughter did not have to leave work to go get their ill father to come down to my clinic to do what? Wait. And then when we were finished, she took him home and then went to the pharmacy. And then after all that, if there was any time left in the day, maybe she went back to work or conducted the, the things that she needed to do for her own health. And just the time and inconvenience and lost effort and all of that for a gentleman that did not need to be in my clinic. We could have done this work outside of our clinic. At the bottom of the screen, now we're up to about 14 counties served. So I'm well over 10% of the population area of, of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And what I found and learned but I didn't understand was the poor have computers. It just didn't occur to me. I mean, if you're destitute and you don't have a home, you certainly don't have a computer. But what I learned was that the people of less means than many of us are on email. They're on Facebook. They're on eBay. And that they can conduct care in this manner. The biggest take home when we had the MBAs run our numbers was this. We increased our practice capacity almost 15%. That means at the end of the day, I had an extra hour to do something. I could see new patients that I wasn't able to see. I could spend longer with patients that needed my time. I could bring people in the same day that they needed care, and that way it helped me diminish comorbidity to the, to the health system and increased expense. But I had an extra hour of every single day. Also, when they ran the numbers, almost the same number, 15% decreased per capita cost. Now, I'll tell you that only 15 or 20% of our practice actually uses these visits. But what we found was we saved so much money overall, and it was so efficient, and we were able to actually increase our economy of scale so when we have somebody conduct a visit, I can bring someone in the same day and take that position, that we lowered the per capita cost of our practice 15%. And you know, I have hospital systems out there trying to make it on 1% or 2%. And these slopes are sharpening. And the reason is because the first six months we didn't really do any visits. And so what I would tell you is, is I fully expect these to hit somewhere around 30 or 35 percent. And that's what Dr. Bachman's model predicted. And just my own clinical intuition looking at what comes into my office every day, what could, what, what could, what could we tolerate? Well, I think that's about what we could tolerate is 35 or 40 percent. And the bottom line here for for many people which are our, our accountants or people that are, are, help us for fiduciary responsibility, what is the, what, what's the actual potential of what this means? Well, I tried to run some very, very simple numbers. I'm not an MBA, but, I, but you know, I try to say, listen, we have 300,000 primary care providers in our country. And, and, you, and on the left over here, there's a little uh, a model uh, that's, that's not ours. It's just came, it came from somebody else's work uh, in industry. But these are where people go after hours. And if you just kind of run that model, 
what it very quickly tells you is just in primary care savings alone in our country, we can save over $9 billion a year, and we can do that very easily. But more importantly, if you said, well, well when I look at my, my iPhone, here's what I think. You know, this phone has been around, I swear, 50 years, but it's really been around four, I mean, five and a half years, but you would think it's been around forever. Well, think about implementing a delivery model like this and where we would be in four or five years. Well, eventually, this is going to touch every family in our country one way, in one way or another. And if, and if you move to say just with with out with that with the 1.2 billion visits we have in our country, 40 percent of those were conducted this way. And you run some quick numbers. Well, to me, that's almost 29 billion dollars, which is about one percent of the healthcare budget. And I was at, and, and that's important because I was at a lecture one time where a gentleman was very wisely said, if you can't implement something in the healthcare system, it's going to affect the healthcare budget 1%, why even bother? You know, you're just spinning your wheels. But now that's just the direct savings. We didn't calculate any indirect savings. I didn't calculate what it's like to miss work, how much that costs, what it costs to drive, coming in back and forth. You know, we, and I think that's going to be even more substantial than this. And I would leave it to those people that do that for a living to tell us what the implications are there. But I do know this. I do know that we're on track because Deloitte in January came out with almost the same number. They said that M Health is going to save our health care system about $30 billion a year. And that's the same number that we're hitting. I want to stop for a second and talk about the triple aim. And for those people that are I guess that may not that are joining us that don't really understand or have never heard of the triple aim, that is basically the mother of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. It's the conscious of what we want to try to do for our health system. We want in our health system to make the patient's health care experience excellent. We want to engage our patients. And what we're finding when we make our mobile, when we make our e-visits mobile and use this kind of this newer generation telemedicine, telehealth, their experience goes up markedly. They become engaged. They become active participants in their health care. We found that we reduced the cost, and our studies, our pilot study shows that we're reducing our cost of at least 15%. And then overall, we believe that we're improving the population health. I mean, how, how are we going to really implement the ACA? And now wait just a second and think about this. Our health system, our government, is asking us to take care of more people for less money. I mean, we're going to take care of 30 million, 29, 30 million immediately, but we're all pretending like we don't have another 30 million on the sidelines that aren't going to come in too, because they are. And we're really not going to have any functionally more providers. Well, to me, technology has to be an integral part of this. And what I believe is that some of the implications of what we're doing is how we're going to change our delivery model. This is a new delivery model. I'd like to come back and talk about that slide that I mentioned to you at first, the part about is telehealth and the, and the benefits or the savings a myth? Well, if you keep doing things the way you're doing it, you're going to get the same outcome. If we do, if we conduct healthcare the way we're conducting it now, by 2020, we're going to be short 100,000 physicians. But you know what? If you make your doctors 20 or 30 percent more efficient, you're not going to be short any doctors. If you change the telehealth model to a newer generation telehealth model, if you're going to add that delivery system to our country, it's going to make the ACA possible. It's going to help change the dynamics of our health system. And I want to spend some time talking to, about each part of the health system and what I've just kind of I've learned just, just, just being a casual observer as much as a participant over the last two years. From the patient's point of view, I'm going to walk you through each part of this and I'm going to start with the patient. For the patient, they get convenience. They get care wherever and whenever. And this is the key part from their doctor from someone that they know, the health system that's important to them. They get convenience, just what, just what you want. And that's why we have, I think that's why we have a lot of the urgent clinics, that's how we have retail clinics. People want convenience. They want less disruption in their day. But this takes care of that. And it's easy to use. We develop through lean systems such that when we use the, when we use the mobile e-visit system in our, that we developed in our, our office, we pull the patient through, so when you go to one question, you have to go to the next question. When you go from you're the doctor, when you had to go from one screen, you have to go to the next screen. We try to make it very easy for people to use. And again, our rule was if you can conduct email, you can conduct an e-visit. From the provider hospital system side, well, firstly, I think that you're going to see just uh, from a business point of view, I think you're going to see a market advantage. I was driving in for, uh, to New Orleans 
getting ready to give my presentation at Hims, and I saw a sign that we probably all see, and it says, seven minutes to see our emergency room doctors, and people were advertising this. But you know, it occurs to me that if you had a competing health system across the street that put a, a, a sign up right under it that says, house call with your doctor, no wait, then you know, if I'm a patient, I'm going to vote for that. And people will walk across that zip code line and do it. And my brother's an administrator, and he says the way they look at things, he says that in a patient's lifetime, $100,000, a profit follows that patient somewhere. So if a patient walks across the street, say it's a 10 or 100 or 1,000 people walk across the zip code line, well, that's a substantial number. And you know, that's not altogether bad. I think when you're talking about new delivery models, if, it, if there's a competitive advantage in the market, it's going to help that model come around. And we, and I, in my opinion, we do need this model. We need an improvement in our health delivery system. 60% of the hospitals own the doctor, I mean 60% of the physicians are owned by hospital practices. And at least in our model, we demonstrated substantial savings uh, and, and, and increased capacity. I think they'll see the benefit of that. I think you're going to see reduced admissions. I mean, we had a, 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 a article that came out uh, in one of our, our journals last year that said if the nurse that doesn't even know the patient calls them up two or three days later, that we can reduce readmissions 25%. Well, how about we conduct the first visit, uh, you know, by your own doctor a day or two later, or if it's a complicated case, even the same day you go home, you're getting ready to leave the hospital, we, we do an e-visit with your doctor, as many physicians have left that practice, they're an outpatient practice, how about we do this? And I think you're going to see at least 25 or 35 percent less readmissions. I think you can see, a, 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 I, could, I could envision where we can see less ER losses. I was at HIMSS and I had a gentleman tell me that uh, their ER loss for people that they know can't pay was somewhere around $2,500 out west. And he says in Miami he thought it was around $7,000. Well, how about if we just take people that we know that can't afford to pay and we ask them, would you have a computer at home? And if they do and, and they, they have the educational level to conduct the visit, then what we do is we set them up with these outpatient e-visits and we give it to them for free. We set them up with our outpatient clinics so that we don't take a $2,000 loss. We make It just becomes pennies. And, 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 and now we have people that have medical homes. I'm a Paul Grundy disciple. I mean, I think I believe in what he says. We need to help in medical homelessness. And the only way we can do that is to make the medical home more available for people. I think you'll see hospital systems or health or practices use this as a communication or PR tool. I mean, it's, it's sexy. You know, you do a house call with your, with your patient by phone. You know, you can advertise that. But more importantly, we can now, now we know who these people are. So, so say if I say somebody hits a 50th birthday, I can send them a little note through this to, through, through this type of technology and say, listen, happy birthday! Had you had your colonoscopy? Maybe I could give a little, you know, two paragraph story about a vignette about an executive that saved their family, that saved their life and helped their family by getting the colon scope. Have you had your mammogram? Have you had seen your doctor once a year? You know, I, I I'll probably be able to we'll be able to data mine this. We'll know who has high blood pressure or, or low thyroid disease, and you could say, would you like some information from your doctor? every once in a while on these on these problems. And you know at the end of it maybe I put something about our hospital system so you can kind of advertise. I I heard I read an article where Shahid Shah, one of the healthcare uh, geniuses of our time, talk about true mobility in the health system. And now the way I see our health systems work by and large, you have to conduct care with the health system the way they want you to conduct it. You need to see us in this manner. A few of them have e-visits but most of them say, you need to come in to see us in the clinic, and this is how you need to interact with us. Well, when you provide mobility in, in online care, so now the patients can do the way, can, can conduct care the way they want to. So they can conduct care, say, at a, at a, at a computer at, at, at lunch at work. They can conduct it before they go to bed at night. If they're traveling or an executive, they conduct it on, a, on an iPad or an iPhone. But, you know, the same goes for the physician. Now the physician is not landlocked to the office or the home. If, say, I'm watching my daughter play soccer and I have an e-visit, I can take a look at it. And because he's not emergent, well, I, you know, if I do it 30 minutes from now or an hour from now, well, the patient generally doesn't care. They just want to conduct the visit so they don't have to seek other means. But this allows both parties to have mobility in the health system. And to me, because now it's efficient, it's true mobility. It's not, a, not artificial mobility. I think that there's going to be room in the, health, in the home health and palliative care. How can we make these practices uh, more efficient, especially since that we get kind of the free vi the video portion and audio portion for free. And lastly, again, for the health system, we can now make Medicaid profitable. We're going to have to be able to make to, to, to drive our health system where we can make money on Medicaid and Medicare with these current or even tightening goals. And this, if we conduct care as a portion of our care this way, it's going to begin to make these systems profitable. From the employer point of view, 
Well, I feel like it lowers their health costs. And I think we can let Linda Fouché talk a little bit more about that later. But, you know, when you don't have people missing work because they have, you know, minor problems uh, or, say, small follow-up problems, well, you know, that, that's about four hours of the day. In our office, we call it the Thursdays. People have been sick all week. And then by Thursday, they finally had enough. They come in, and they're coughing, and they have a fever. And I'm getting ready to walk on the door. I've given them a little antibiotic or something if they need it. And right before I'm a hang on the door, they say the same thing. Doc, can you get me off Friday? So now they're off, too. They've been sick all week, making everybody else sick, and now they're off Friday. But you can imagine if they did this, say, last Thursday or Friday with their own doctor after hours at work, well, you know, how much less comorbidity and problem would we have then? We felt like that for industry, there probably is not going to be, for this type of technology, any out-of-pocket expense. In the first-generation uh, uh, systems that are out there, uh, our colleagues said, well, the best way, the best model for us is to go into the industry. We'll get a certain amount of money. We can show you a, we can show you a, a, a study that says you're going to save $300 a person. If you give us half that, we're going to make your technology available to you through our nurse practitioners. Very admirable. But can you imagine if all of a sudden the industry doesn't have to pay, well, any of that? I mean, they're not paying the $150. They may have to pay for the office call. But you know, that's probably going to be a fraction of what it would be just to go to a, a, a primary care doctor or a specialist or certainly much less than an urgent clinic or an ER. Again, I think, it's going to, I think it improves morale. What we're seeing in the people that, that are telling us in our private practices, you know, not only are they more productive at work, but the morale's better. From the insurance carrier's point of view, well, it's going to lower global acuity. And again, if you're not going to the emergency room, heaven forbid, if you're, and if you're not going to to the, to the urgent clinic, if you're, if you're not even going to the doctor's office as much, that has to be less. What I've seen in Kentucky is we're about to add here 400,000 people this October. And you know what? We don't have any more providers. And these people that will come online are going to be the working poor. That, to me, means that they can't really leave work because if they leave work to go to the doctor, they're going to get fired. And it's very hard if you have Medicaid in Kentucky to get a doctor. People, they just, doctors just can't afford to do it. So what we see, what to me is coming up is, these people, the glass of water is already full. If you're going to pour more water into it, it's just going to spill out over the table. These 400,000 people, they're going to go to the ER. And they're not going to go once a year. They're going to go two or three or four times a year because that's going to become their primary care doctor. I think that if you have a telehealth model inside the medical home, it changes everything. It changes the entire dynamic of the distribution system in our country. And I think it is a modern approach to health care, and I think it's going to bring, bring insurance carriers to see the reason of it. And then kind of lastly, from the governmental point of view, what does our government want? Well, they want improved access. They want people inside the medical home model that's been demonstrated over and over again to be the most expensive, least expensive, most comprehensive model out there that saves health expense. They want to improve provider shortages. Again, if we spend a decade slowing our doctors down with EMRs, say 20 or 25 percent, well, how are we going to increase their, their work 20 or 25 percent and make them more productive? Well, what I found is in my own practice that this made me substantially more productive. And I can conduct these visits between my regular office visits or after hours. It's irrelevant. They're so efficient, it just doesn't take but a minute or two. It allows us, like for example in Kentucky, we can take care of Appalachian or disparate populations, people that are shut-ins or can't get to the doctor. And it's going to allow us to address multilingual cultures. We have a substantial portion of our country now that speaks, you know, uh, two languages, and we're going to need to, to communicate with them in multiple languages. And most importantly, we want to increase patient engagement. When people take an ownership in their health, it changes the health care outcomes that they get. For any new model or any delivery model, we have to decide, is it going to be sustainable? And here's, a, a, this is kind of a summary of a little book that I read called Exploiting Chaos. It said there were three things you have to have to have to, to, to make a, a, a delivery model or a, a, a new technology, uh, some innovation sustainable. The first is, does our market need it? We know if healthcare doesn't need a new delivery model, then just, there's just nothing that does. I just leave that for the, for the listener. But it also has to pass with a, a dynamic test. I call that the cool test. I mean, would you tell somebody about this? If you did a house call with your doctor, with your own doctor by phone, would you come to the supper table and tell somebody about it? And I felt like we passed this test the first week. We had an executive who was in another area at a board meeting conduct a visit between the break and came back and told his board what happened, and they didn't believe him. And this is something people will talk about, and it will, I think it will eventually, it will eventually come to every separate table in, in our country. And the third test has to be, is it simplistic? Can they get their mind around it? 
So when they made the movie Aliens, the guy came in and said, listen, Jaws in space. And the, and, and the producer said, you know, we can make that movie. Well, this is kind of a house call by smartphone. I mean, it's more than that, but the, patient, but the public can get their mind around it. You talk about a public that's already conducting e-commerce. They've already gone by the health system on this. We're actually trying to catch up to them. My brother is, a, is a, one of my brothers is a, I have a large family, and he's a, he's a finance guy. And he says, you know what, Doc, I don't care about any of this stuff. I want to know two things. Does, your, does, does, does this thing that you're conducting, does it solve a problem or does it save money? And that's all I want to know. And if you look at it in those cut and dry terms as an accountant, here's what I would say. We increase access. If I can do anything more but tell you that I can get more patients in your clinic, would you, would you move in this direction? If I told you that all that I could do was make the patients, that, that I could engage them, I could make them happier, that by conducting this we can please them more, would, that, would, you, would you invest in this? If I told you that we can make your clinicians manpower 20, 20 or 30, 20 or 25 percent more efficient, at least 10 or 15 percent more efficient, would you change this, would you change and put this model in your clinics? From the other side of the point of view, from the other ledger, we have demonstrated in our, in our pilot model that, that we are lowering per capita cost and that that slope is sharpening. We are, I think we've demonstrated how this is going to be used by institutions as, again, not only a new delivery model, but we're going to see less ER losses. You're going to see less re hospital readmits. You're going to see more profit uh, to our health institutions that are trying to make it just on a sliver of profit now. And, and with all this that we've talked about the last hour, does this increase the global health system cost? I see it dramatically will decrease it, and that's what our numbers suggest. I'd like to leave you with this. In 2010, Blockbuster, which didn't see the effect of the Internet era, went and, and conducted steps to, 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 well, they went into bankruptcy. Netflix, which saw this era, changed their model, and they reported record profits that year. And this is what's going on in our society. We have a new delivery model coming. A portion of the outpatient care in our country is going to go to Netflix. It's going to come in this manner. And I'll leave you with the fact that which one of these models are you going to conduct in the future going forward? What Kindle has done to online book sales, what online banking has done for finance, and what iTunes has done to the recording industry, mobile e-visits are going to be for health care. In summary, I've tried to demonstrate to you today that mHealth and mobile e-visits are not only possible, that we've tried to demonstrate they're safe, effective, and it's the public's preference. The mobility in the medical home represents a positive disruptive model in healthcare, and that true mobility can really actually bend our cost curve in our country. And lastly, I'm going to submit to you that the gold standard may not be the doctor in the room with the patient, but it will be your, the doctor with their patient, no matter where they are. That the distance does not diminish care. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your time and thank you very much. I believe that mobility will forever change our health delivery system. And if I can answer any of your questions later on this afternoon, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you very much, Dr. Thornberry. I found that to be a very thoughtful and very comprehensive insight into the landscape about mobile online health care. It really does sound like we're approaching a tipping point for another major revolution in how we can improve access and communication in the medical home. A number of you have begun to submit questions. You can continue to provide questions during the uh, remaining presentations to follow. We're next going to hear from Linda Boucher, who's a human resource coordinator, about her perspective on how this te technology improves access and cost and also communications for her employees. Wonderful. Thank you. That was an interesting presentation, Dr. Thornberry. Um, I'm looking at mobile me visits from two different perspectives. I look at it from an employer perspective in addition to a personal perspective because I have actually used the technology several times. From an employer perspective, I've got to tell you a little bit of a history about our company. We are a rural electric cooperative located in South Central Kentucky and we have about 65 employees. In 2007, our CEO uh, got in his car, ready to come to work, turned the car on, and had a massive heart attack and died. So we went on a search to find a new CEO and someone who was going to come in and be a visionary and be very, very intuitive with cost within the company. 
So the employee base, this man was 55 years old who passed away. So you can imagine, 55 years old, no prior health condition, suddenly he's deceased from a massive heart attack. So that brought an awareness throughout our company of, wow, you know, he never, he never saw it coming, nor did we. So we went on a search for a new CEO, and we found a leader who is certainly a forward thinker and a visionary. And this man in particular had a, an MBA in finance, so he came in and looked at the numbers in many different areas of our companies, and one of which was healthcare. And what we found was in 2008, our healthcare cost had reached a, a historic high. And so he gathered his senior team together and said, I want you all to be forward thinkers. How can we attack the problem? Not just the rising cost, but what is creating this rising cost? And the answer to that question was, well, you know, we're a, a, a rural company, and we have some employees that never go to the doctor. And the risk you take with that was one day they could potentially be on the table getting their chest cracked open. So they had no health care coverage, some of our employees. Um, so we decided to implement, we had a, on our health care plan, this is very interesting, we had a $100 deductible for a single plan and a $200 deductible for a family plan. And this was in 2007. And our new CEO came in and said, we just can't do that. We're a self-insured company. We've got to be more cost conscious. And the question was, how do we get our employees engaged? How do we get our employees to have a little bit of skin in the game? So he came to the senior team and said, I'm going to recommend that we raise our deductibles from $100 for a single plan to $1,000. $200 to two to 2000 I think it was. And uh, our response was, you will get run back out of town. But what he did was, being a strong communicator, he said, let's implement a wellness program. And we had an employee who was actually a nutritionist on staff here. And uh, so you have a $1,000 deductible or a $2,000 deductible, but if you participate in this voluntary wellness plan, we're going to give you the opportunity to have a $0 deductible. That is, if you meet the criteria, which was established by the National Institute of Health for a certain blood pressure criteria, a BMI criteria, and an LDL cholesterol and a nicotine criteria. So we had four areas that we were looking at. And we said each of those would account for, say, on a family plan, $500 each. And then again, we thought, well, we can't just throw this on the employees, so let's give them six months six months, we'll test them, see what their blood pressure is, and that criteria that the National Institute of Health recommended, let's make it more liberal for the first year. We want our people to succeed. For instance, the blood pressure recommendation was greater than or, let's say, less than 120 or 80, I think, and we moved it to 140 over 90, saying we want you to pass this first year, and we're giving you six months to work on it. So we brought in a primary care physician and we tested all of our employees and said, here are your numbers, here's your BMI, here's your cholesterol number. If things are high, we recommend that you see a physician. You've got six months to get this in order in order to earn a wellness credit. Now, in addition to doing all of this, we allowed the employees to use the primary care physician that came in. They could visit that doctor if they chose. And in addition to that came the mobile me visit. So we did implement that program, and year by year, in the past four years, we've seen success in controlling our medical cost. Uh, we did not have an increase. We had a cost savings in 2009 and 10. Some of it was a little bit of luck that each of our employees, since they have some skin in the game and they have to pay some money if they don't meet this National Institute of Health criteria, the money comes out of their pocket. They know their blood pressure numbers now, every one of our employees. They know their BMI. They know their cholesterol numbers because it hits their own pocket. Uh, we provide them with an educational component here where we have a nutritionist come in. We've changed the foods for our safety meetings. You know, we were having donuts and uh, anything else we could find that was very high in fat. And now we're serving at our safety meetings things that are much better for you. Uh, the mobile me visits. Now, here's what's happened with that. Here's what I'm hearing from our employees. Number one, they love it. You know, they're pulling out their iPhones, getting online, 
and normally we saw the thing Dr. Thornberry was saying, you know, on Thursdays they start getting a little sick and suddenly they're sick on Friday. Now we don't want our employees here if they're sick at all, but we encourage them to seek medical care, whether it be through the mobile me visit or on your computer at your office. If you have something minor, we want you to get, get it under control before it becomes something major. Um, on a personal level, I utilized it a couple of times. Once I was attending a conference in San Francisco, California. I live in southern Kentucky. And I woke up the morning of the conference and I had a very severe eye infection. And it was very, very sensitive to light. So I was in a human resources conference, so it was really ironic that sitting in a round table discussion, we took a 15 minute break. So I pulled out my iPhone, I went on the mobile me visit, put in all of my symptoms, it went right to my own personal primary care doctor, which was very comforting. And when we took a break for lunch at noon, I walked across the street at a Walgreens pharmacy and picked up a prescription. And everyone in the room said, how did you do that? And how can we do that? And how can we get this involved in our company? Because number one, I'm not leaving work, I'm not leaving meetings. I'm there and I'm engaged. Um, the reimbursement for our employees. Now when they go utilize a mobile me visit, uh, they go online and our charge is $32 and they pay for it using a credit card on PayPal. Okay, now we talked to our insurance carrier and we said, we like it when our employees utilize the mobile me visits because we're keeping them here at work if they're not really that sick. Say they've got an insect, an insect bite, they've got pink eye, they're staying here, they have insomnia. They're going on their lunch hours. They're not wasting their sick leave time. So we're keeping them here. We've told our insurance carrier what we would like for them to do is every Tuesday send a check back out to reimburse our employees. Anyone who utilized that mobile me visit, they get a full refund of $32. So they're out absolutely no expense. As an employer, we spent nothing to have this brought to us. You know, all we do is we tell our employees uh, to sign up online and they're good to go and we have no dollars invested. And the value it's bringing to our company and cost savings is just phenomenal. Um, you know, we almost feel like we've got something figured out here and here we are, South Central Kentucky, a little small town, but we've got engaged employees. The morale's improved. We've got people staying at work. Um, they almost find it kind of fun to pull out a phone and go on there and say, oh, I'm, I've got to get me a script for um, my nausea or my sinus infection. And the people that are sitting next to them look and say, how are you doing that? How are you doing that? And then you're talking to your very own doctor. Um, so from an employer perspective, I'm seeing a lot of cost savings. How many other companies can say we've not had cost increases in our med medical cost in the last almost five years? Um, now we anticipate that our costs will rise in 2013 due to regulatory changes that we're hearing from our insurance carrier and probably some minimal health provider increases. But um, as I've said, our employees are loving it. Uh, it's easy implementation for, for us and the patient. You know, it's a straightforward interface. Um, we just love it. No out-of-pocket expense for this technology brought right to our laps. I don't have anything further. Great. Thank you very much, Linda. That's a very interesting perspective from the employer standpoint. I appreciate that. Uh, next, we're going to hear from John Rogers, who's going to tell us a little bit about what he sees as the impact on people from uh, as an attorney and uh, senior law partner. And John? Yes, thank you. Just to remind our guest, um, I'm an attorney, have a in private practice. Uh, I have a very, very busy practice. Um, I have a large office, a lot of staff, but I am a uh, solo practitioner. So if I'm not in the office, then um, we don't make money generally. Um, and there are, are some exceptions to that, of course. But, um, and so when this first became available to, to me personally, um, as, as uh, e-visits online through the, uh, through the uh, desktop, yeah, it was just a really a, a godsend to me as far as being able to, uh, you know, visit with my uh, primary care doctor online and, and um, be able to, you know, be treated, not have to be out of the office, and I would actually do it when I was in the office. Um, 
and it enabled me to be here and and uh, not be out of the office. And that was just, you know, saved me a lot of time, help make, you know, help me make money in my office. And um, it, there were probably times I would think that I would not have sought treatment and may have even gotten sicker if I had not been able to have the e-visit uh, available to me. And so. Um, my opinion is that it really has improved my health uh, in that I can uh, not only, you know, it helps me in my practice and be here, but it also enables me to be healthier uh, because there are times I just think practically I probably just wouldn't go uh, to the doctor or, or try to seek a, a doctor visit because I just really wouldn't have time to because, uh, as Dr. Thornberry said, the, you know, offices are just so busy it's, it's hard to get in on a timely basis. And, when um, mobile e visits or me visits became available, uh, then that was just even better because I travel a lot as well, um, doing seminars uh, around the country and um, also for travel for you know, pleasure as well. Uh, that there are times that I've used that uh, when I wouldn't have had that opportunity to, to get treated quickly and get quicker. And then when I get back to the office, I'm already well and I don't lose time in the office uh, because I've already gotten better while I'm traveling. Uh, and it just, you know, it's just something that has really uh, revolutionized the way I seek health care uh, myself. And uh, it's, um, I, I just can't imagine being without it. There are times that, um, you know, I've thought, well, gosh, before this, uh, you know, just what, what, what did I do? And, and um, when you try to, ex you know, explain it to folks and some of the, I think Dr. Thornberry and um, uh, Ms. Fouché mentioned, you know, people find it kind of strange or unusual, and, and I've had that experience too, um, but then they um, they try it themselves and, and are very, very pleased with it. And so I've never heard anything negative uh, about it, and I've heard, never, I've not had any negative experiences with it. Uh, and from the standpoint of, you know, I feel I always am concerned about am I giving the right information to the doctor, did I forget something? And then there's that comfort level that I get, and, and I know I've inputted that data as far as my history, what my symptoms are, and, and I know I haven't forgotten anything. And it just kind of provides me that little checklist to get that information to my primary care doctor. And so to me, it, it, it gives me even a greater comfort level in knowing that I'm providing the right information, and I feel like I'm, I'm getting better treatment in that sense. So um, overall, it's, it's just been a wonderful experience for me uh, as a patient and um, just cannot imagine being without it. And now my iPhone is, you know, I use it, and as we all, I'm sure, do now. Uh, I, I very rarely use my laptop at home or my laptop in the office. Um, I'm using my iPhone and for everything, um, checking, doing research online. I have all my um, legal research apps on my you know, uh, on my iPhone, and so I'm using, my iPhone is what I use, it's what I go to, and so now with me visits, it's right there, uh, the app is right there, pull it up, and just uh, create the visit and do it, and it's just quick, and it's right there in my pocket, and it doesn't matter wh whether I'm at lunch or uh, whether I'm in the office or, or where I am, I'm going to, even if I'm in the office, I'm going to use my iPhone to do the, the me visit, so it's um, it's been something that has just revolutionized the way I've Solid health care. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you, John. That's a very insightful perspective on how you personally benefit from mobile e health technology. I appreciate that. And uh, lastly, we'd like to hear from Anna Maria Lenzo, Lorenzo, who's a clinic administrator, and she's going to talk a little bit about the impact of mobile e health technology on clinical workflow. So, Anna Maria. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. And um, I wanted to let you all know that we were actually part of the two-year pilot study that Dr. Thornberry mentioned earlier in his presentation. Um, implementation, the transition into using mobile electronic visits, um, me visit technology has been phenomenal. Um, it's been a smooth transition. Our patients have all loved it. Um, from a business, a practice standpoint, um, of course, you know, being able to open up a lot of opportunity for growth um, is key. It's important. Uh, we have a lot of 
uh, offices uh, and providers that just have their offices congested with patients that really don't need to be there. Um, we've been able to basically double our patient capacity per provider um, that's using the MeVisit technology. If we have a patient that's calling in or needs to be seen for something minor, uh, like the, their allergies are acting up or they just need a refill on their prescriptions, then those are the patients that we encourage to use the technology. And most of them are very happy to use it. Um, uh, we're able to bring in patients that need the hands-on patient care um, with, their, with their physicians. Um, not to mention that it's also increasing new and permanent revenue stream from the e-commerce community. Like uh, Dr. Gombray said earlier, a uh, practice that um, I'm sorry, patients bank online nowadays, um, you know, they're shopping online, they're pretty much doing everything online, so adding that convenience. Patients want convenience when you sum it all up. Um, if they don't need to take the day off of work, if they don't need to come in um, and sit in a congested waiting room or be exposed to maybe the flu, um, or whatever else is in the office, then they have the ability. It's just giving them an additional option. Um, so using it as a tool has just been remarkable. We've been able to increase a patient load capacity at minimum of 15%. Um, our productivity is exceptional as well. Um, it's increased patient engagement. You have a lot of non-compliant patients that just don't come into the office for many different reasons. They could have financial reasons for that if they don't have health insurance and know that they're going to have to pay for the visit on top of having to go in and pay for their prescriptions, they're going to opt to use me visit technology because, of course, they're not going to pay as much as an, a normal office visit would cost. So um, it encourages them to just stay in contact with their physician and continue uh, their health that way as well. Um, of course, you're going to lower your per capita cost by 15% as well. Um, we've been able to, like I said, double the amount of patients that we see in a day and not have to worry about increasing staff. Um, you know, your, your overhead does not go up by um, bringing in more patients. So, it, you know, increasing the quality of, of your practice life um, is, is very important. Um, of course, I've, I've been able to contribute to meaningful use. Um, Easy integration with our EMR, it's been wonderful. We have Spanish-speaking population that can get online and do their Spanish visits as well. Um, so it, you know, it, it's basically has been a no-brainer for us. Um, it's an easy ROI, you know, you're, you're talking, you know, our providers are doing their visits in under three minutes. So, you know, you're getting at least a minimum of $10 a minute just to do a visit, which, you know, you can't beat that. Um, you know, patients are going to pay differently according, you know, office to office, but um, in our area, because we are rural, um, we're only charging about 32 to $35 a visit, but um, providers will, all, you know, decide on what their patient population is um, able or willing to pay. Um, from a provi provider standpoint as well, um, reimbursement for intellectual work, um, you know, there's plenty of times they come into the office and before they even start seeing patients, they have a stack load of charts, um, messages, refer requests, and things like that. Um, so much time is spent and wasted on returning calls and messages while patients are waiting in rooms or even in the waiting room to see their provider. They're there um, to, to come and get care. So to be able to turn around a visit in between patients and eliminate that workload the providers have to deal with um, before, during, and after um, actually increases their quality of life as well. So our providers are actually going home at 5 instead of at 8.30 like before. Um, continuity of care, you know, with improved patient engagement supports the medical home. You know, if our patients are not able to come in um, because of the fact that they realize it's 5.30, the office is closed, they can't get in to see their physician, and now they're going to go to the urgent care or the emergency room department, um, which of course eliminates the whole medical home concept, but on top of that, it, it also increases um, a lot of room for error. Um, you know, the, the safety, continuity of care is just, it's diminished that way, of course, not to mention that we're raising health care costs by um, having our patients going into the ER. So staying connected to the provider is very important. Um, if it, what can I say? I mean, me visit is efficient. Um, 
you know, the physician has the option to call the patient if they chose to. They can do video chatting. Um, I've had a couple of providers that have actually picked up the phone after they've received and they visit just to call the patient to thank them. You know, thank you for using this new technology. Um, I've called in your prescriptions to your local pharmacy. Let me know if things don't get any better. And that was it. Just hearing, the patient hearing from our, our providers um, felt they were important. You know, staying connected, um, they felt more of a bond with their care provider. Um, and of course, that's important. It's important because you don't want your patients to feel like they're just a number. You want them to feel like family. So it kind of goes in with the whole um, concept, again, of keeping your patients within your medical home. Um, patients want convenience, um, you know, quick and easy. Let me, I just need a refill on my meds. Like I said, a patient can have strep throat. They know it's strep throat. Their child just had an antibiotic called in two days ago, and now their, their throat hurts. So why take the time off of work? Why come into the office and sit there just for maybe a Z-packer or an antibiotic um, when they can just get on their computer or their iPhone um, or Android? Our physicians um, use either tablets, Androids, um, whatever whatever they have access to mobily. You can be anywhere. You can be at a soccer game and call in the prescription for your patient um, for the antibiotic. I mean, it's pretty much a no-brainer all around. There are benefits um, for all of them. Implementation, very easy. Um, we visit has superb customer service. Um, it was just very easy to get engaged with um, our patients, and now they're all connected. I get emails constantly from patients thanking us for using the service. And that's pretty much I have, all I have. Very good. Thank you, Anna Maria. Another very thoughtful perspective on how it easy how easy it is to integrate new technology into existing workflow. We're about five minutes before the bottom of the hour, so I don't think we're going to get to many of the thoughtful questions that you and the audience have submitted. But uh, if I could summarize them, uh, they tend to fall into buckets about reimbursement and uh, workflow and work-life balance of all things. And perhaps Dr. Thornberry and uh, your guest, if you wanted to speak a little bit more about uh, reimbursement, how, how does the money actually flow? Uh, Linda mentioned that her employees pay out of pocket and they're reimbursed by the, their provider, by their payers. Is this now a common practice in the insurance industry or do you still have battles ahead? You know, we met with our insurance provider prior to implementing this whole process of mobile me visits, and we said we want to make it easy for our employees to participate in the mobile me visits. And we said, how can we go about doing that? We want them to be reimbursed before they ever get a credit card bill in their mailbox. And so that's when we made the decision. And I think it's up to, we talked to the Kentucky Insurance Department to make sure we could do everything legally. And we did get approval to go ahead and send reimbursements every Tuesday. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to interject, too, that I failed to when I was speaking earlier was I have a college-age daughter who was out of town a couple of hours away, and she has asthma, and she didn't have her inhaler with her. So she pulled out her phone, went online, did a me visit, and was able to get an inhaler sent to a pharmacy close to where she was. Now, you can only imagine the other college-age kids that were beside her seeing her do that on her phone. And her reaction to them was, you mean you can't do this with your provider? She thought everyone could do that on your cell phone. But I did want to make sure that everyone knew that even the college-age kids love having access to this. Um, but the reimbursement, getting back to your question, uh, we just chose to do it that way to make it easy for our employees. Is uh, Medicare and Medicaid playing now, or is that? So you have to be determined. Excuse me? Are Medicare and Medicaid reimbursing for mobile e-visits? Hmm, I don't know. Well, Chris, let me, let, let me, uh, let me uh, add to that. I think right now that, that you know, we're talking about a new science. It's an emergent, emerging science, and though we've been doing it for two and a half years, it's just been made public 30 days ago. Now, we've already had, uh, at least from, uh, from the... Uh, from the company's point of view, uh, we establish a company to share the technology. That's, that's what our goal is, to let every patient or every provider that wants the technology to try to have access to that so we can make a difference in the health system. I'm sure that we need leadership uh, from, from CMS 
to, in, in, in these efforts, not just the technology for this company, but for every company that's working in this area. This is how we're going to make our health system work, and they're our leaders, and we're going to have to have leadership from them, and also, I think, from the insurance industry. WellPoint has told us uh, in memo that they're going to cover this, and it will be handled with each practice as they handle all CPT codes. Uh, we were given a, uh, our own code by the AMA. But that being said, it's more important not just about the product, it's more important to me about the technology. What are our next generation, our second generation telehealth models? Will they be reimbursed? Will they need to be? And we need to have states and our federal leadership in, in our senior insurance carriers to talk about how we're going to make this possible because it's going to save our whole health system money. Maybe as a follow-on to that, uh, Dr. Thornberry, talk, can you talk a little bit about your uh, integration into the workflow? I, I had the impression, and uh, Linda mentioned as well, she was able to get a, a response back while she was at a meeting. It sounded like you batch your calls up toward the end of the day and then take care of them in mass, or are you, do you have somebody that's, monitoring these calls all throughout the day? Well, that's a great question. It's actually quite the opposite, Chris. <clears throat> what I do is I just keep my cell phone with me. And though I can do this on a computer, it's much more efficient for me to conduct it on the cell phone. So what we do is, is when the calls come in, I take a brief look. I get a little text message. I look at what the first complaint of the chief complaint is. That comes to us with a date and time stamp and the patient identification. And we decide, am I going to handle this between cases? Am I going to handle it at lunch? So generally, I don't really have to batch it, particularly if I'm in the office. What I'll do is I'll send the information back. That takes 30 seconds to a minute and a half. And I'll have the staff actually provide the, uh, the prescriptions to the pharmacy. If it's after hours, well, you know, I do it. I kind of look at it and do it at my convenience because that's what the patient's expectations are. And I, again, need it to fit into my life, but that's going to keep me and other health care providers engaged. So you don't really have to batch it or take time off. Great. You Very know, our good. CEO's spouse, excuse me, our CEO's spouse um, was feeling ill at 2 in the morning and just picked up her phone and said, you know what, I'm going to do a mobile me visit. And uh, she did. She went on at 2 in the morning, went back to sleep, and when she woke up, she had an email response that said, your prescription has been sent to the pharmacy of her choice that she had mentioned. And she said she never dreamed it would be available as soon as she woke up that next morning. Wow. Very amazing. Well, I see we're at the bottom of the hour, and I want to thank Dr. Thornberry and all of our guests for very delightful and very intriguing and, and very exciting time that we're in now to see this technology emerging and looking forward to its eventual widespread adoption throughout the medical home community for both improving access and cost and quality of care. And uh, thank you folks for uh, also in the audience for participating and we hope you, hope you all be able to join us on our next uh, webinar, which we should be advertising quite shortly. And uh, a good day to all. Thank you. Thank you.